Today we will build a little embedded systems using Altium Designer 10. And before we actually start, let's set up our environment. Let's launch Altium Designer 10. You can see it takes a little while since it's a fairly large application. And what you will be seeing is the default um, setup that the screen comes up with. You can safely close the window of the storage manager. First, let's check if we have a license. If we click on DXP My Account, we can see the available license options that we have. We can see that my current user has one on-demand license and it's currently expiring in May 2012. So we can safely click on this one and say use. This will switch my license from the license that we used before to this particular license. Once we use the license we can see that right now we have 30 more licenses on this particular on-demand license and currently we are using one out of 30. Next we will have to create a new project. Click on File, New, Project, PCB Project. This will open up the Project tab. And what we can see in here is that we currently don't have any documents within our project. So let's add new to the project a schematic, a schematic library, and a PCB library. Before we go any further, let's save all these things on our computer. We right click on our project, save project, and this will come up with a series of save dialogues. We want to save them in our documents folder. So we click on documents, we right click into it, say new folder, and we call this homework one. We open up that particular folder, and we now call our PCB library homework one. It opens up a new one to save our schematic library. We also call it homework one. And last but not least, we want to save our schematic sheet homework one. The final dialog is our project itself. And again, we call it homework one. We can now see on our left hand side in the tab that all our files have the name that we assigned to them. And at the same time, Altium Designer opened up our schematic library and gave us an overview window. I don't particularly like the overview window, so I usually just close it. Next, we have to choose a microcontroller to put into our system. For this, we open up Chrome, and let's just search for one of the MSP, Texas Instrument MSP430. So MSP430, we can see and get the link to the general MSP430 um, environments and I already chose a particular one and I want one of the two series and in the particular case I want the MSP430 AFE253 this particular microcontroller has three channels 24-bit ADCs which are very very interesting if you want to have high resolution um, analog inputs the first thing we have to do is download the um, data sheet of this microcontroller. So this is the data sheet. We have an errata sheet, which will tell us what's wrong with this particular chip. And we have the family user guide. The data sheet gives us all the electrical information, while the user guide gives, of, gives, of, gives us more broad information on the different peripherals on the chip. So we open up the data sheet. And what we find in here is all the different information that we want to know about this particular microcontroller. We can find the different types of microcontroller that are available, what type of package that they are available at. So in this particular case, they're all the 24 TSOP packages. Plus we find some block diagram overviews of the different peripherals, pin assignments, which we will use later, etc., etc. Plus there is a lot of electrical information and um, what the register maps look like, etc., etc. You can see this data sheet in includes a lot of information, including footprint information that we will use once we make our package. So first, let's just keep on this one here because we want to actually create the footprint for this particular microcontroller. So I rearrange our screens, move this one here onto the right hand side of our screen 
and I will put Altium on our left hand side. For now I will make this project much smaller so we have some more real estate on the left hand side. Next we want to actually open up our PCB library. So we open up the PCB library and what we see down here at the bottom is that we got a new tab called PCB library. If we open this one up, we can see what the content of the PCB library is. In this particular case, we right now have one component that doesn't have any pads or any primitives. First, we want to add a footprint for this particular um, device. So let me zoom in here a little bit so we see actually the different dimensions that we need. And we will use the tools IPC compliant footprint wizard to create the particular footprint. This footprint wizard is very easy to use as it just asks us for the different dimensions of our chip and it will generate a standardized footprint for us. So first we will have to choose what the package is that we want to use. So in this particular case it's an SOP, small outline package with gullwing leads. Once we click next it will ask us for the different prop sizes of this um, package. So fortunately we have this open here on our right hand side width of the range so this is MH the total width which will be here 6.6 .6 to 6.2 to 6.6 .6 millimeters so it's already entered maximum height 1.2 max already entered minimum standoff height 0 0.5 that's we can see this over here maximum body width and 4.5 millimeter so we can see E, that's the maximum body width. Maximum body width here, 4.5, so that's good too. Maximum body length, 7.9 millimeters entered, 7.9 millimeters on the data sheet, so we are good. We have 24 pins in this particular case. We have the lead width range, minimum and maximum, so this is B, if you see here, this is the lead width range. This is what the data sheet gives us, 0 0.19 to 0 0.3 lead length range this is the L part here and for this we have to move over here it's 0.5 to 0.75 already entered and the pitch 0.65 pitch is also given here in the data sheet 0.65 alright we click on next we don't want a thermal pad for this particular package as there is none uh, we want to use the calculated values for the SOP package heel spacing we also want to use the default values for the soldering fillets, default values for component tolerances, default value for IPC tolerances, default values for silk screen dimensions, and default values for SOP courtyard assembly and component body information. So last but not least, we have to give this um, particular package a name. We want to actually name this as TI names it. So this is the ti pwr pdso g24 package and we want to actually save this in our hot homework one pcb library and that would be it as we can see our component is now on the here if we double click it we can see its name once we say okay the component shows up footprint with all the different numbers and everything with all the different layers that we need already filled out. So let's save this and move over into our schematic library. This is where we actually draw the schematic symbol for our footprint. So what we have to do is down here again we go into our schematic library tab to see that there is one component already in this system. So we can double click on this one and just rename it. The default designator should be u$ and u$ question mark. This will be later on replaced with a number and the question mark. The description of this device, so this is the TI MSP430 AFV253. Symbol reference, we want to call this TI MSP430 AFV253 again. Now, since we're already in this dialog, what we can add is a model. And if we add a model, we want to add a footprint model for this particular case. So we say OK. We want to use a footprint and we browse for it. We want to choose our hardware library, a homework library, and we see here the footprint that we just created. We want to assign this particular footprint to our schematic symbol as seen down here.
Once we click OK, the footprint mod will show up here in this small little model and also down here in this list as footprint with the name of our particular part. Next, we want to draw our M schematic symbol. So, in order to do this, let's move up back up all the way to the top to the MSP430 AFE2X3 IPW. So this is all the pin designators that we have for our particular foot, uh, particular microcontroller. To start off with, what we have to do is we want to draw um, the pins. So we say place, pin, and what we can see is a pin showing up with two numbers, 11, and on the other side, um, the connection for our device. We rotate this to start off with our um, pins assignments. Zoom out a little bit. So we want to start with, actually not with 11. So we double click on this one here. We say this is actually pin one. Again, place a pin. So if you press on your keyboard PP, it will be press a pin. Now we can see we have two, place two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and one more, twelve. So let's move over here to the right hand side a little bit. Let's flip this over to make the other side, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. Don't worry if you have them misaligned a little bit because you can later on go and move them around into the right position. While we have all the different pin assignments right now set, what we still want to do is we actually want to name them as they show up here in this data sheet. This will later on make it easier for us once we are in the schematic to actually connect things to it. In order to do this in an easy way, we can double click on our component and there is a button at the bottom left called Edit Pins. If we click this, we get all our pins in a nice little list for us to be edited. The designator we want to keep as 1 to 24 as this makes the link between our schematic symbols and our foot pit print designators. But what we can change is the particular name. In order to do this, we just double click on it we click on, on it and it highlights it and now we can replace its name. This is A00 plus and by clicking the arrow down we will move down into the next field A00 minus A1.0 plus A1.0 minus ABCC ABSS VREF A20 plus A20 minus test SBVTCK RST inverted NMI SBVTDIO P1.0 SVS in TACLK SMCLK TA2 13 is DVSS P26 XT2 in P27 XT to out DVCC P11 TA1 SDC clock P12 TA0 SD0 DO P13 UTXD0 SD1 DO P14 URXD0 SD2 DO P15 CMO0 SVS out TMS P16 Sony TA2 TCK P17 UCLK0 TA1 TDO TDI and the last one P2.0 STE0 TA0 TDI TCLK. So by now you might wonder what do these different things actually mean? Well, if you want to know what they exactly mean, you have to read through the, the data sheet or through the family user guide. Grosso modo, you, once you learn these kind of families, you will know that the different names are here for the different peripherals. So A0.0 is, for example, the positive of the differential analog input. 
This is the negative of the differential analog in point zero, point zero. So is the 1.0 plus, 1.0 minus. AVCC is power. AVSS is the ground for the analog side. VREF is a reference signal for the um, ADC on this particular device. A2.0 plus and A2.0 minus is the third analog input channel, differential input channel, positive and negative side. Test SBWTCK, this is a test pin, not sure what this exactly is for, but SBWTCK is the clock for the programming of this particular device. Reset NMI SBWTDIO, the reset is to reset your device. NMI, not entirely sure what this means, but the SBWTDIO is here to actually program this particular device over, the serial, over a serial um, command interface. P10 is a GPIO P1. SVS in is a voltage controller and you have you have or you can switch it over into a clock for the timer A or you can output its um, secondary master clock or you have an it as an output to the timer 2. DVSS is the digital ground P2.6 is can be I, this pin can pin 14 can either be used as a GPIO or as an oscillator input Pin 15 can be used as a GPIO or a oscillator output, so you can actually connect a crystal in between them, and I just noticed a little mistake here. DVCC is the digital um, power pin. P11, 12, so these are all GPIO lines, or they can be switched into different peripheral functions. So timer functions, um, I square C inputs, UART here, so this is a UART transmitter, UART receive, or we actually also have a SPI mode, so a serial peripheral interface mode. So this is the slave in master out or slave out master in, plus here is a clock line or a chip select line. Once you have all of this assigned and these names made, you click OK, and this all became a big mess. Now we don't need the data sheet anymore, so let's make this whole thing bigger again so we get some more space on here and actually realign all these different pins. So let's move them out so that we actually see all of them. And last but not least, let's add a nice little box around it. So we say place, rectangle. I want this rectangle to go from here to right about here. Let's move this rectangle um, to the back. Um, hmm. Interesting. View. Here we go. Bring sent to back. All right, and we see all the names again. The last thing we want to actually center this component right around the center. All right, let's save it. And now we are ready to actually place this component in our schematic. We go over and switch into our schematic. Right now it's still empty. And right clicking into the schematic, again, we can place a part and um, we say choose because we want to choose a part and we want to select our hardware library uh, homework one library and the part that we just created we click ok ok and here it is the microcontroller that we just created we place only one of them in our schematics and we can look at it first things first so let's hook up all the different power pins that we have on here press P on your keyboard and W for wire. We extend the digital ground lines. We extend the digital power pin. We extend the analog ground line. And we extend the analog power pin. Next, for this particular board, we hooked all of them up to a the same power source. So VCC goes to VCC, AVCC goes to VCC, and we have the same ground for DVSS 
and ADSS. All right. Next thing, we have to add a programming interface as every microcontroller has to be programmed. Since this is an MSP430, I already prepared us our JTAG interface. And you can get them from our class website. So let's browse over to our class website. And on the website of our, your first homework, if you scroll down, you can find two libraries, a PCB library and a schematic library. Download both of them and copy them over into the homework one directory. So from here, we want to copy them over into our homework one directory. Next, we want to add them to our project. And the easiest way to do this is if you just drag them, drop them over into your Altium. You can now close these two windows. And going to the project tab down here, you see that these two documents are two free documents. In order to add them to the project, you just grab them and drop them over in your project, and they will be linked from within your project directory. Going back to our schematics library, we can now use these libraries. So we say place part PP on your keyboard, you choose, and on this library drop down menu, you can now see that there is, if you go up, an ECE 5780 schematic library. This schematic library has a couple of different components, so it has a couple of different capacitors and from Murata inside of it. It has a chip LED from OSRAM and it has the TI SPW interface. We want to use the TISPW interface because we want to program this particular device. And we just pop the, one of them in here into our schematics and we now wire it up to our system. Fortunately, this interface already has all the right nice little names that makes it easy to wire it up to our system. So first, let's place wires and extend these lines. And now we will find the lines that they match up with up here on our M microcontroller. So let's see, place wire. We have the receive, this is the UART interface, UART receive. We have VCC, this is fairly easy, we just connect this to a VCC line later on. The test SBWTCK, test SBWTCK. Great. Reset SPWTDIO. That's the one just below. Ground, we just wire up to a ground symbol. And the transmit over here of the UART. So how do we make the connection between these lines and these lines? How do we indicate this? Well, that's rather easy. We can place a net label on all these lines with um, the space bar you can actually rotate all these labels and components around and we just want to make labels right now on all the different lines that we have you can see right now the names are the name the net labels are the names of these particular wires and as you can see they're all different so what we want to do is we want to rename this one here as SBWTCK and you can do this by just simply double clicking on the label. In order to make a connection between this label and this label, you just name them the same, SBWTCK. And now, Altium knows that this particular wire is exactly the same net as this wire, and there will be an electrical connection made between the two of them. So let's do this for um, the rest of the wires, SBWTDIO. SBWTDIO. Receive. Transmit. Receive. Transmit. All right. Two more things. We want to hook this up to ground and power.
and that's it. In theory, we now have an embedded system that can be programmed through this particular interface. Now, the embedded system doesn't do much yet. So what we want to do is we want to add some LEDs. So we place a part, if you remember, we have in our ECE5780 schematic library, we have a chip LED, an OSRAM M0603 LED. So what we want to do is we want to place one of these LEDs And actually, we don't just want to place one of them, but we actually want to have a series of them. <sighs> All right, let's add some more of them. Two, three. Seven and one more eight. Let's move them up a little bit. There we go. In addition to that, we need a resistor. For this, what we do is we go into the parts library. We choose a part from the miscellaneous devices library. This is a library that's provided by Altium that has a lot of different components in it already. Um, we want to choose a resistor, but not this one here. We want a SMD resistor. As we can see, there are a lot of different packages down here, and what we want is the 0603 package. Click OK, and we connect the resistors. As you can see, all these resistors are right now sized at a at one kilo ohm. In order to change that, you double click on the value and we want to say only a hundred. Another way of selecting all of them and editing them is you can right click on one of the resistors, find similar objects, and what you want to do is uh, we want to say that the value in here has to be the same. As you can see, all the resistors got selected that have still a value of 1k, so what we now can do is we can go in here can double click on this and we say 100 ohms and this did not work all right so we just go through them 100 oh. Next, we want to hook these lines up to the different I.O. lines we have over here. So we place wires. Between these different components. Let's make this with a name. Or we can just go through here. With this, oops.
All right. Now we have a couple of other lines over here, especially the analog input and the VREF, and we really don't want to waste any of these lines on our microcontroller. So what we do is we place a part, again, from our miscellaneous connectors library, and what we want to do is, in this case, we want to have a header, a regular 100 mil 9 m pin header, like this one here, and we place this one up on here. And what we want to connect to here is power, ground, and all the different analog inputs. So let's start with creating again a bunch of lines. In this particular case, I'm going to use a copy paste strategy. It sometimes works a little faster. because it's easier to get the exact same length um, that we actually want. Next we can copy four of them and connect them right down here. Um, let's take three of them. And that will be it. We'll place um, net labels on them. Zero zero minus a one point zero plus. We actually forgot a line up here. Oops. A zero zero plus minus a one plus a one minus u ref. A two zero plus A two zero minus and same thing up here A zero plus A zero minus as you can see once you enter the name down in here, um, Altium knows about all the different possibilities that he has. So if I start typing A1, it will start cycling the further I go through all the different possibilities that there are. So this was A1+, plus. now we write A1 point, and we show, see that there's the minus sign. So A2+, plus, A2, oops, A2, minus and that was actually wrong we want this one here v v ref a2 plus and a2 zero minus plus as we said before we want a power and ground on it all right there are a couple of things missing still. Our LEDs need a power line, so we connect power up through here. Plus, we want to add a couple of decaps. Decaps are basically there to provide smoother power to our microcontrollers. So place a part. We want to go into our ECE5780 library. In this particular case, we want to have a 10 microfarad capacitor right next here to all our LEDs we want to have a 1 microfarad capacitor over here plus another 0.1 microfarad capacitor also over here Let's actually switch them around. And in this particular case, we actually don't want to see the comment. All right. 
only thing we still have to do is hook these things up to the power and ground same with the one over here ground and power and that's it let's save this whole thing let's save the project and next we want to add um, next we want to add a PCB there are several different ways on how you can add a PCB to Altium Designer one of the easiest ways to get all the, diff the right layers and everything set up is by going through what's called the PCB wizard. You can find this one in the files tab. Unfortunately, it's all the way at the bottom. So even on this fairly large screen, we actually don't even see it. So what we have to do is we have to make some of these other um, components smaller. And now you can see it here, PCB board wizard. The wizard is fairly intuitive. So you choose what kind of metrics you want. We choose Imperial. You have a couple of different pre-layout boards that you could use if you want to use one, but in our particular case we want to use a custom one, rectangular, and we make it 1500 mils wide and um, 1000 mils high. Click on next. We only want two signal layers, no power planes because we only want to have a two layer board. We only want through hole vias. The board has mostly surface mount components in our case, and do you want components on both sides? No. We keep the default for all of these different um, metrics, and that's already it. Clicking finished will show you our small little board. Now, as you can see, there are no components on here yet. And before we actually import all the components from our schematics, we will save this particular case, add it to our um, project, right-click, and save it. Again, we make sure that we are in our homework one directory, homework one, and it's saved. Next, we can click on design, import changes from homework, uh, homework one project. And what will happen is it will present us with a change list, engineering change order, of all the things that it found within the project that but are not already on our PCB. So we want to validate all these changes and we can see that the status more or less checked out so let's execute it what happened is we have a couple of errors in these particular cases so what are these errors um, let's review them duplicate component duplicate net names etc etc where does this come from well if you look at it we still have these question marks on it so what happened is we forgot to actually annotate our schematic so let's go back into our schematic as you can see all the components are all still have the question marks and in order to get rid of them you can go through tools annotate schematic update change list and it told us it changed 22 um, names so it will change the designators from this to this all right we accept this again we validate execute it and we close it and all of a sudden all these different components have actually a number so let's save this go back into our PCB design import changes from project validate the changes execute them and as you can see now all of them got check marks everything is okay and all our components actually appeared so before we start actually the big layout let's think a little bit of how we want to lay out our board so we have our microcontroller we certainly want this in the middle somewhere we have our interface connector let's move this one to this side and what you can see here is already a big problem we have these small little wires that are called air wires and you can see that they're all going crisscross this means that connectors from down here will have to go up here and connectors from down here will go up here so in order to make the layouting or the routing later on easier, let's flip it around. 
And as you can see, we have much fewer crosses, only the power and growl here on the top. All the others are actually laid out very, very nicely. Our programming interface, similar, we want to minimize the amount of wires that have to cross the whole board. So let's zoom in a little bit. Let's have a look at this. Let's flip it around. Seems to have fewer crosses this way because we have these two here that go over here and these that go here on the left side so we don't have to have crosses between these two. Very nice. Next, we have all our LEDs. So let's go and grab them. D6, D7, D5, D4, D3, couple more, it's D2, D1. All right, these are all our LEDs, so let's first arrange them properly on this board. Right now, as you can see, our grid is at 5 mils. So what we can do is by hitting G, you can change the grid to 50 mils, much larger resolution. This allows you to make very quick um, alignment settings because we want to have a really nice layout with all these different components. So D5, D4, D3, D2, one too close, and D1. Next. Let's also grab all these text labels that are right now all on top of each other. And as you can see, because the 50 grid label now doesn't allow us to really center them. So let's change to 25 mils. And as you can see now, we can actually grab them and align them properly over here, exactly where we want it. In case you ever get confused and don't know which label belongs to which one, once you grab a label, you can see that the component that it belongs to is actually highlighted and the rest of the PCB is um, made a little bit darker. All right, perfect. Our LEDs are here. Now, next step is our resistors. So let's switch back to our 50 mil grid. Oh, all right. Seven, six, five, four, three, let's just move them over here, have them closer, R2, R1. If you look at this, what we see right now is that the resistors and the LEDs are actually all wrong. So we have to flip them all around in order to get the routing correctly. If you see, this pad here is connected to this one here, but by flipping them around, this is a direct connection, very easy to route later on. Unfortunately, this also grabs the label with it, so we will have to fix this, um, all this label mess too again. So let's grab label. Again, switch the grid to 25. R is over here. R8 is actually the one down here. Seven. As you just saw, if there is a disambiguity with which particular label or part you want to choose, a drop-down list comes. You can choose, I want to actually text label D 
R6, T5 or the resistor itself. So in this case I want to actually grab T5. R6 I can choose now. This one here is R5. D3, R4, R3, D2, R2, D1, R1. All right, so already looks pretty good. I think this one here is a little bit too close to them, so let's move it over just a teeny little bit. Only a couple decaps left. In order to remember where we placed them, we really want them close to the different power rings. So let's go and look in the schematic. We have C2 and C3 next to the uh, microcontroller and C1, the time microfarad, next to the power rail of the LEDs. So we go here into our PCB, take C1, we really want this close to power rail of the PCBs. Unfortunately that doesn't exactly work where we want it. So what we do is we grab all of them just up a little bit so that our capacitor around here fits nicely in here then up here we have C2 on our power rail and C1 and C3 so if we go and check we have C3 is our point 0.1 C2 is our 1 so we want the point one closer to our pin. That's the C3. Closer. All right. Great. Could actually move this one up a little bit. To really have everything on the same grid. Perfect. Well, this already helps us a lot. As you can see, um, our placement of the different parts has nice lines all over the place, and I can already tell you that the nicer um, your air wires look like, the easier will the next step will become. So first of all, let's save our PCB, and let's save our project. So the next part will be layout and what we have to do is more particular the routing itself so what you can do is there is a auto router so you can auto route all and I can show you what happens if in case we do this in this case Altium tries to route your board by itself unfortunately auto routes are not as good as you wish them to be so it already finished it routed the whole board as it is a very easy board but you can see it looks like a big big mess and that's what usually happens with auto routers they just don't have enough information unless you really configure them properly in order to get a proper routing done so this is not what we want we actually want to manually route our board so first let's start with important connections that's all the different power lines so we know that there is a power wire on here you can click on the auto um, interactive router that helps you a little bit but you still actually place the traces yourself on here we want to have a trace from here and it shows us now all the different components and pads that have to be connected to this particular net so we can see that all these components through here have to be connected plus a couple here plus the power pins over here power pin over here so the first one that we want to do is we want to go through all of these but before we do that, we want to change the width of our trace a little bit. You can do this by just hitting, by clicking on the wire, and while you're in interactive mode, you want to hit the high comma. 
of your keyboard at the tab I'm sorry tab of your keyboard now you can change the properties of your particular um, trace that you want to put down so in this case let's choose 15 mils ah didn't like it Uh, we want to change the rule width because right now minimum is 8, maximum is 8. So maximum, this should really be about 25 mils. Now we are free to actually change this to 15 mils. It didn't accept it. Strange. Maximum 25 mil. Preferred width. No. There we go. Now we can choose 15 mils. And you can see our trace became immediately bigger. So let's connect all of them together. And voila, our first trace is put down. Next, let's see what else we can do here. Have another power trace. That goes right through here. Now we need to change our grid so that we can... In general, you don't want to have right angles, but since this is a power network, it's okay to do so. Um, all right, we have another power goes through here and connects over to that one. Let's do this. And it also goes over here. Oh. Plus, if I'm not mistaken, we go up there, but we don't want to do that just now. Next, let's just route all these lines already since they're really easy to do we just route all of them straight through everything easy and straightforward just finish this down here all right a couple of more traces programming traces And now you can start to see that we get into some problems. We have a wire here that has to cross all the way over here. And we have a ground that's over here that has to cross all the way over here to here. And it doesn't go through here or we can go around here. So what we can do is we can go to the layer below. And we can do this by placing a trace from here, go straight out on the top layer. And we can go down into another layer by hitting the star key on our keyboard and as you can see now our line becomes blue which means we are on the bottom layer so we move over here the middle of these two hit star again come up and can connect to our lines on the top now these are called vias and the particular vias by default are pretty big so what we can do is, in the PCB um, inspector that's not here, so you can find it here on 
um, PCB inspector. You can change these vias. Right now they are a whole size of 28 and the via diameter, diameter of 50. So this can easily be changed down to 16 mils and 25 mils. And that's a much more reasonable size of a via. Actually, let's change this to 32, 1632. All right, let's finish this up over here. I have one more power trace. Again, since we have to go from here to here, we can do that. But what we can do is we can go down to the bottom layer, either by clicking here on bottom or clicking automatic the star key we can place a track from here at the bottom to here and by default actually go and change the via hole size to uh, once again tab let's change via default hole size to 1632 all right we need to edit the via rules minimum um, let's do the minimum of sixing maximum preferred 16 via hole size minimum oops 25 preferred 32 minimum 16 preferred 16 so this is now 16 this way as soon as we want to make a via hole here we will actually have the right dimensions there is one more ground connection over here place trace we are at the bot top so we want to go down to the bottom layer place a trace from here all the way right in between these two pop up to the top and connect to the ground pad okay now we have this one here that has to cross all the way over to here and we have another one and this one here which has to go up to here so before we do that let's first make all these lines because they are all very trivial and I show you another trick as I said initially auto route doesn't do a very good job but you can actually easily use it for connections that are very trivial so if you do auto route connection you can see that this particular connection it just goes straight from here to here so why have to route it particularly all the other really can do these kind of things very easily for you you can also do e similar things for these routes here as they are not very difficult to route there we go and we have a couple more lines here, 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 and here. All right. Now, there are a couple of more lines left. We have to connect power from here to up here. That's an easy one. Instead of going down in the layer, we can see that we have actually plenty of space out here plus we want to go from here to over here so let's do a little change more particularly what we see is if we want to go from here to here we would have to go all the way around and over here but instead we want to move this particular hole in here and then reroute it with a shorter connection so let's select the track let's delete all of them and reroute this from the bottom here want to go in here come up and connect to here 
This allows us to go from the bottom directly, straight up and over to here, come up and connect over. One more connection left, or two more connection left actually. Again, we go from, oh, we actually want to start at the bottom layer. Go over here, place a via, and connect it to the pad. One more ground connection from here to over here, but we can grab this nowhere. Let's see what we can do here. Mm. Can actually go on the top layer and connect it over to these. No, can't cross here either. So this is a little bit problematic. Let's think. I guess the easiest way of solving this is by dismantling this particular way. Trace here again. And we can now go from here we dive down here connect over to this one here and for this one we start at the top um, no, we can actually already start at the bottom Connect to our hole and be done. All right, this doesn't look too bad. One little modification here. Why do we go up above, down to the bottom and over? We can actually do this easier by starting at the bottom, reduce one via hole, which is actually what you want to do. Vias are not really good for your signals. So as long as you can use less vias, the better. And that's it. Our first board is almost done. Oh, one more from here to ground. Oh, no, not again. Let's think. I guess we have to split this one up. So that here we can have an easy connection over. So what we do is start at the top from this one here. Unfortunately we have to add one more idea to it, but else the routing would not have worked. Alright. Guess that's it. Pretty much everything is wired up. Let's reset all our airlines and let's do a design rule check and see what we have. Ooh, lots of errors, 132 errors. But first, let's see what these errors are. First one is room definitions. The room definition is this one here. And in theory, you would want to have all your components within your room. So what we can do is, let's actually move the room, not by moving the room around, but by using these marks that you can barely see right now, extend this over, such that all our components are actually within our room. All right. We can close this one here. Let's run the design rule checks again. Voila, a little less, no more room errors. We now have 84 silkscreen errors. We ignore these for now, um, as our manufacturer can actually cut them. Minimum solder mask slivers, we can also ignore them because um, manufacturers can easily adjust for them. So voila, that's it. Our board is ready, except we want to add a little bit more text to this. The problem is, if you produce this, you will have a lot of different pins that are around your board, but you don't know what they do. So. 
in order to actually annotate them we can place text so p string and right now this is on the bottom layer that's not exactly what we want we actually want to place text on the top overlay or also called silk screen so place a string right up here and we know that this particular string here is actually VCC we want to use a true type font because they look a little nicer and yes why not Arial perfect next we can copy the string and now add it we want to have another one um, 100 mils here another one now let's go to 50 mils another one I need to go to 25 so I can place it right where I actually want it another one here and what I will do is I will actually name each and every pin so later on when I actually want to use this board I know immediately what I have to connect to which pin. So I still remember that this one here is ground and if we zoom in here we can see that this one here is A2.0 minus so this must be A2.0 plus oops VRF A10 minus A10 plus A00 minus and A00 plus oops our VCC is gone VCC all right so now we have these pins marked we won't mark these here because first of all they are small and second this is the JTAG interface so the JTAG interface will be actually used by a, diff a specific pin in the hardware which already has all the pins here if you want you can add labels here but note that we do have actually one label here that's this small little dot and that indicates that this is pin 1 so even if you don't have labels you can go back to the schematic and find quickly which one pin is at uh, pin 1 on here so two more strings left on here we actually want to add a name of the board MSP430 AFE253 eval so that's just the name that I give this board I remember so I remember what this is plus I actually want to add a date code to this board so that I remember which particular version this board is in case I have to do a second one so this is version 1.0 and the date code today is 8182012 all right you can add as much text as you want but don't clutter your board too much but also don't forget for example your name so in my case I want to add down here my name so we know who made this board plus oftentimes you want to add a company logo in our case the University of Utah we made an actual font that has the Utah logo on here in order to get that font you can go back to our website and in the homework 1.2 We have the Utah font that you can download, click on, and install if you have administrator rights on your computer. Since the font is now installed, we can again go back into onto our board. We can add a font here, and in true type fonts, we can now choose in here the Utah font. And the particularity about this font is that if we use write a capital U 
we will get the Utah logo. And since it is a font, we can easily change its size. So we can make this, for example, 150 mils high, and we get a nice big logo. All right, let's look at the board. This looks pretty good. Off to the almost last part, and that's making our Gerbers. But before we do that, I really don't like how these labels look. They are a little bit too big, and this label here is anyway outside of our board itself. So, we click on one of the labels, find similar objects, and what we want to filter on is the size text height. We say this has to be the same, plus they are all stroke fonts, so we want them to be the same too. Ah, it actually found all our Arial fonts, so what we want is this to be different. Let's see. Nope, that didn't work either. So, this to be the same, but we want it... Designator. Nope. All right, unfortunately, since we already added fonts that are all also 60 mils high, but true types and ours are stroke fonts, unfortunately, we can't filter on them. So what we have to do is we just have to manually select all these big labels. Now, as you note, Altium actually noticed that I'm selecting a lot of labels, and it doesn't start and try to select the traces unless I'm really, really close and on top of one of them. Alright, now what we can do is we can switch them over to um, true type fonts. Stroke font, text kind, that's what I would have had to filter on. And we want to actually f switch them over to true type fonts. Makes them look much nicer than before. And we chase this guy over here um, and move it in there all right let's save this again one more thing before we can actually do everything we have to add a board outline this is one of the things that's a little bit strange in Altium even though that we see that our board has is a uh, 1500 mils wide and a um, thousand mils high it actually doesn't save the board outline in a different layer. So what we want to do is we want to go into mechanical layer 3. Let's quickly check that there is nothing in here. Mechanical layer 3 and let's draw an outline. So we just place lines, go from here to here to here, to here, and back down again. And we really want to use this outline only because we want to tell the manufacturer where to cut our board. You can not just make rectangular boards, but you can actually also make round boards. You can make cutouts into boards using this particular outline. So let's check that there is no one else on our mechanical layer 3. We find everything that's on the mechanical layer 3. And as you can see, it really only selected our outline. Great. Next, we have to generate our Gerbers. Let's go back into our project, right click on our project, add new to project, and what we want to do is we want to add an output job. The output job is here to generate a lot of different files based off from our PCBs. And the ones that we want to generate are actually fabrication outputs. So let's click on fabrication output Gerber files for our PCB project. Plus, we also need to add the NNC drill file for our project. All right, first let's configure our Gerber files by double clicking on it. We want it to be in inches, two, five. The more important one is actually layers. We want to get top layer, bottom layer, uh, top paste, top solver, top layer, bottom layer, bottom solder, bottom paste, bottom overlay, and the mechanical layer 3. All the others 
are not used. Drill drawings, we don't need to do any things. Apertures, we don't need to change anything. Advanced, we don't need to change anything. Let's click OK. Let's quickly have a look at the NC drill file. Inches, 2.5 for the format. That's perfect. So press drilling zeros. We can leave all of that. Excellent. Already configured. Now, we have to tell the output job to actually generate these files. And we do this by saying that we want to have the folder. And we draw it over and click on these little buttons. So once you have this selected, click on the small little triangles and that will enable or disable the generation of Gerber files and NC drill files. Next, the default generation is actually a little bit strange in Altium. It places all the NC drill files in a different folder, all the Gerber files in a different folder. So we want to change that. As you can see here, this is the default output. Gerber files, one folder, drill file, other folder. We don't want that. What we want to do is we want to change this into output name. Actually, we want to remove all. We want to keep this as output type. And instead of release managed, we want to do this manually. Say done. Now we get the option, op option here. Do not include an output folder. And project directory, everything is now in one folder. That's not exactly what we want. We actually want to do this slightly different. We still want to have a container name. And in addition to that, we actually want to timestamp them. All right, now we get a timestamp folder for every time that we generate all our files. All right, I like that. Let's save our output job. We can call this Gerber's. And let's generate them. And done. Let's have a look. They are in documents, homework. All right. And as we have them now, project outputs for homework one. Nope. Uh, here we go. The date time, generated files, and all the files that we want. First of all, you can start deleting some of these. So we don't need the aperture. We don't need the extrap. We do want the drill report, bottom layer, bottom overlay, bottom paste, bottom solder, GM3, our outline, top layer, top overlay, top paste, top solder, LDP not needed, rep not needed, rule not needed, text is needed, that's the NC drill file, APR lib not needed, and status report not read it. All right, these are the different files that we need. Let's go one folder back, let's zip them up. Um, send compressed zip file let's call them a <coughs> MSP 430 AFE254 and today's date is 1 8 2012 hmm? all right so let's go and check it freedfm.com My email address. We confirm it. Choose a file. Documents. Homework. Time. Our zip file. And we upload it. On the next screen, we will have to configure what's inside of our file. So the DRR is just a drawing, others, they're actually not using it. Bottom layers, bottom copper, bottom overlay, bottom silk screen, bottom paste. That's the bottom solder paste. Bottom solder mask, BS. GM3 is a drawing outline. GTL is top copper, top layer, top overlay, top silk screen. Top paste is the top solder paste. Here we go. TS, top solder mask. Text is the NC drill file. The bottom, they want us to in add a couple of more information. So part number, MSP 430 AFE253, I think. Oops, I actually mistake before. Revision 1.0, we have two layers, 
in our board. Dimensions is 1.5 inches by 1 inch. We don't want an array. Uh, we don't want tab routing, no scoring. FR4 is good. Finished thickness, normal, let free processing. That's fine. We don't have gold fingers. We have solder mask sides on both sides, silk screen sides. Um, let's do on um, both sides silk screen color, white, copper, non inner. We don't have any inner layers. Vias, anything normal. Um, and that will be it. ITAR, no. And submit. And that's it. Our design is now analyzed and we have to wait for our email. All right, our email is in. As you can see, we have several links. First one is for the quote, if we actually wanted to order it. Second one is plots of our um, Gerber files. So let's have a look at them. Top silk screen. That's all the text that will be put onto our board. Looks good. Next, we have our top solder mask. This is uh, where we will have removed all of our solder masks. So that's the green mask usually. The copper on our top. Bottom copper. So this is the traces on the bottom that we can see. You can see two differences here. For some reason, these are not as thick as the others. So that's something that we have to check. Um, of what's actually going on there. Um, the bottom solder mask and the bottom overlay, nothing. Of course, we don't have any text at the bottom. And if you want to look at the drill file itself, that's where they will drill holes into it. All right, informative, but not very useful. Um, the one that's actually useful is the DFM. And what we can see here is no showstoppers. That's exactly what we want to see. And there are a couple of problems that they fixed automatically, as we saw in our design check itself, some of the solder mask clearances were too small and they actually checked them and resized our boards. And these are actually plots that are very interesting. You can see our board in full glory. Um, everything is there, mostly. Um, so let's go and check what's actually going on with our bottom overlay and with our bottom layer. So let's go and look into our PCB. This looks good. So it looks good here in our design itself so let's go and actually open up one of these Gerber files because Altium Designer can open Gerbers themselves so this is the bottom layer and we can go and drag this right into Altium and it should use Camtastic to actually open it and as you can see the Gerber looks good so I think this must be a problem of 3DFM so we are all set and we are done with our homework submit these links and we are good. Thank you for listening.